Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After my video on Apollo 10, many people asked me why did the lunar modules left in orbit of the Moon decay and crash into the surface? After all, on Earth we have an atmosphere which tends to slow satellites down and cause them to crash, but the Moon lacks these. Well, during the Apollo program there was a great example of a pair of satellites which were launched from the Apollo spacecraft. Apollo 15 launched something called the Particles and Field Satellite 1, PFS-1, and it stayed in orbit studying the particles and fields around the Moon for like 18 months. It was like a 30 kilogram spacecraft, it's practically a 1960s CubeSat. Now on Apollo 16 they launched PFS-2. And it lasted 35 days before it crashed into the surface. In fact, most spacecraft that have orbited the Moon have eventually crashed into it, although most of them take it into their own hands as their station-keeping fuel runs low. They intentionally hit the surfaces at a known location to see if they can collect any science from the plume produced. But anyway, the reason for the orbits degrading over time is the Moon is lumpy, which is kind of obvious if you look at it, but it's actually lumpy in a less obvious way than is seen in these in pictures. The gravity field is lumpy and it varies because of the geology. The lumps are referred to as mass cons, mass concentrations, and in many cases they're actually the opposite of what you'd expect. On the near side the low-lying maria are actually high gravity spots. But figuring out the details of the lumpy lunar gravity field would take decades. While it was observed with the early lunar orbiting satellites, it first became a real problem with the Apollo program. Uh, on Apollo 8, the orbit was pushed off course by several kilometres over the few days that it spent there. And this level of inaccuracy would stymie any chance to land Apollo 12 within walking distance of the Surveyor spacecraft. NASA assembled a special team to solve this problem for Apollo 12 and their solution essentially involved collecting extra tracking information on the Earth, feeding it into the computer and as the crew were landing they would change the landing coordinates on the uh, Apollo guidance computer. The Apollo guidance computer had the correct location plugged into it originally but as the, v the deviations and the errors were corrected they would change it to show the wrong location so that when the errors were added in they would end up at the right location and in the end it worked. They were within walking distance of the surveyor. So this was just a case of observing the data, observing the variations and then reacting to them. Actually figuring out the shape of the lunar gravity field with any precision would take a lot longer. In 2011 NASA launched a spacecraft called the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory, also known as GRAIL. It was a spacecraft to map the lunar gravity field. It used a Delta II Heavy and in fact it was the last launch of a Delta II Heavy. That was a special Delta II with the solid rocket boosters from the Delta III. Um, Delta, the GRAIL spacecraft was actually two different spacecraft which were called Ebb and Flow and they would fly in the same orbit separated by maybe a hundred kilometers and they would measure the tiny differences in the distances between them to about micron resolution. As the spacecraft orbited towards a mass con, the lead spacecraft Ebb would feel the effects first and so it would get pulled away from flow and the distance between the spacecraft would show that there was a variation in the gravity field. So over the next year, the gravity field on the Moon was mapped to extreme precision with features as small as you know, tens of kilometres across accurately measured. And so these maps show the deviation of the gravity field from the average. The units are in milligal. A gal is a gravitational acceleration of one centimetre per second per second and it's the, a reference to Galileo. So if you compare the Moon and the Earth, the range in this lunar map is something like minus 500 to 1000 milligal, so that's plus or minus one centimeter, whereas for Earth the equivalent map is 50 milligal. So because Earth is bigger and the gravity field is stronger, it tends to round out the gravitational variations more precisely. With GRAIL's data, the lunar highlands were found to be made of lower density rock than the lowlands. The feature called Oceanus Procellarium, the ocean of storms, was found to be surrounded by a huge rift valley. And this data was able to show even small craters would have a high gravity in the middle where the material had melted and sunk down and become you know, higher density, while the ejecta that had been thrown out was loose and lower density. 
And a recently published study used the same data to conclude that a large part of the difference between the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon is the result of a giant lunar impact in its early history. An object maybe 500 to 800 kilometers across hitting the near side at relatively low velocity, creating fresh lava flows and throwing huge amounts of ejecta to create the mostly thicker crust on the far side of the moon. And after the mission was over and the station keeping fuel was running low, well, those spacecraft too eventually crashed into a mountain on the moon, less than a minute apart. That part of the moon is actually now named after astronaut and Grail collaborator Sally Ride. Now coming back to lunar satellites, there is one really long-lived satellite, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It launched almost a decade ago and it remains in orbit. In fact, it discovered and imaged the impact sites of all those other spacecraft that have hit the moon, including Bereshit, which also hit the moon, going a bit faster than intended about a month ago. So how does the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter stay in orbit for 10 years? Well, the mission planners used a carefully chosen orbit called a frozen orbit. And here, the perturbations from all the different lumpiness of the gravity field are designed so that they cancel out over time. The orbit isn't perfect for observations because it's eccentric and it goes down as low as 30 kilometers and as high as 200 kilometers. And that means that the camera's field of views change depending upon where you are in the orbit. Now, the mission plan originally included one year of orbiting at 50 kilometers, and that was maintained using station keeping fuel. But after the end of that, they pushed it up into this frozen orbit, and it's remained there stable ever since. And it doesn't use very much station keeping fuel to keep there. And that's been a great decision because over the last 10 years, we've been able to see how the moon has slowly changed as rocks and asteroids have hit the surface of the moon and made new craters. We've been able to see spacecraft that have soft landed on the moon and we've been able to see the Chang'e and its rover moving around and we've also been able to see of course spacecraft that were launched after lunar or reconnaissance orbiter and have since met their demise on the surface of the moon. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter can also see the Apollo moon landing sites in great detail. And it's actually interesting because in the last few weeks, there was a paper which took data from those old Apollo seismometers and reanalyzed it using modern techniques. And what they were able to do was show that some of the moon quakes that were observed all happened within about 30 kilometers of what looked like thrust faults on the Lunar Reconnaissance imagery. And so this is an interesting location because what's happening is part of the crust is being pushed up over the other side and these are generating slow earthquakes over time. Now the place this force, the thing that's driving this, is that the moon is possibly shrinking as it cools and that means the surface of the moon is having less surface area to work with so it gets squished. And they also looked at the timing of these events and it looks like moonquakes tend to happen at extrema of the tidal locations. So as the moon moves in and out, it too experiences tides from the Earth. And it seems that this small squishing is slowly driving the moon, these moonquakes. And so that's a really, really cool result. So anyway, if you look up at the sky, the moon may look perfectly round to you, but if you are orbiting the moon and looking down, your mission success may very well depend on understanding why it's really quite lumpy. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.